Hello, Stuart. Hi, Stephen. How are you? I am fine. Thank you very much for allowing us here. You're welcome. I like technology. I have a lot of background in electronics and computers and things like that, but I'm very judicious about what I want. I don't have a cell phone. I don't have an iPod. I don't want them. Uh, yet I have about three computers. I have lots of stereo equipment. I've been an audiophile since I was a teenager, uh, so I like high quality stereo equipment. And I have a uh, high definition front screen projector and hundreds of DVDs. And I do not have television reception here at all. I don't care to have it. Uh, I just want to watch movies as if I were in a theater here in my home. And, you know, that way I can always pause it and get up and get a snack or go pee or whatever and uh, don't have to be bothered by crying babies in an audience. And uh... British humor has always been one of my favorites, but uh, the Brits are just very, very good at classical music humor, which is perhaps not known widely in the United States, um, but going back for a long time, there were the Hafnung music festivals in the early 50s, and of course he died tragically young, and they, they ended, uh, and those were participated in by many, many, you know, world-renowned great musicians. Uh, and uh, Dudley Moore of... Uh, other film stardoms mm -hmm. that would be on the fringe, the wonderful review, and then he did a number of classical uh, pieces. Uh, a, a Beethoven uh, parody that, that has the endless ending of pounding away, pounding away. Um, just wonderful fun. Uh, almost had a master's degree, never quite finished it, in music composition. And uh, so many, many years of that and lots of knowledge and great love of it and still have about a thousand vinyl albums uh, and play those occasionally and go, that goes back for collecting for years. But there's fun stuff too, yeah. Jonathan and Darlene Edwards, uh, the piano artistry of Jonathan Edwards uh, from 1951 and if you look at the cover closely you'll see there's two right hands on the piano keyboard and uh, but that was uh, some of the they did several albums it was this wonderful comedy series in the early 50s but to be that bad they had to be actually great musicians, and they were. I mean, it was uh, Paul Whiteman and Joe Stafford, husband and wife team, who were great uh, club and jazz musicians, and it's so perfectly bad that you roll on the floor laughing and cringe at the same time. You know, you, you don't expect someone, when they're singing badly, to go sharp. She goes sharp and flat. and. That is just excruciating. I don't know which one would be. Yeah, I'm not sure I want the first track. Let's see where we are. Well, I've been in the leather scene and with the fairies for 30 years. Uh, so when I came out, the, the interest was just there. I found the fairies and I found leather people and I explored it. And uh, 
A number of years later, I moved to San Francisco just to be in the leather scene and kind of lived a 24-7 leather lifestyle out there for about four years. And uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, out here, uh, few and far between. But you got a chainmail vest over here. Yeah. Well, I, I like some fantasy gear, and I, I've I've made most of my equipment or toys. Or I like to make fantasy gear. Uh huh. And to me, that that's what leather folk do. We make fantasy real. Sometimes we play very rough, uh, but with a safe, sane, and consensual idea that, that there is no harm meant, nothing is ever done in anger, but it's just intense and even cathartic, and uh, I've been teaching the spiritual dimension of s &M for many years, and uh, well, that, that comes out of my, my being a shaman. I became a shaman uh, many years ago. And I have my own practice. I'm a sexual shaman, which is not a very common type of shaman, but uh, I view s &M as a very, very shamanic act of practice uh, because of its intensity and pushing the body and mind, which is always part of shamanic practice. So that's what, uh, I mean, it. You might call it my worship, and uh, there's nothing better than to really connect deeply with another person that you're playing with, whether you're on the top or the bottom, or really both. I've never seen any contradiction uh, between being a leather man and a radical fairy, because there's many, many things in common, a kind of brotherhood in both communities. And I certainly corrupted a number of fairies starting many years ago, and uh, they became some of the hardest s &M players I've known. So uh, it, it, th there was contention between the groups, you know, going back over 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and so forth. But that has smoothed over after many years and you don't see that. I mean even at ZMS uh, with our shamans gathering in August we're we're likely to have a play party one night so uh, there doesn't seem to be any problems and we've also allowed the uh, the Leather SM Club from Albuquerque uh, to come up and have their own camp out up there to so we, we have very, very friendly relations, and I'm in both of them. So uh, I would like to see more cross-fertilization between fairies and leather folk. Leather has always had such controversy about, just in the gay community in general, um, well, at least early on, because, you know, it was thought as aping uh, patriarchal and you know, um, even racist kind of conditions, but it, it, it isn't. It's just play. It's, it's really a catharsis that can relieve you emotionally of a lot of the, uh, a lot of problems. And when you can play out your fantasies, whether it's being kidnapped or uh, being tortured by the Nazis or uh, things like that, you can actually relieve rather than keep things bound in. And um, so I think it's one of the healthiest things we can do as long as I've said that, that it is done for the good of both people. Great.